So today I want to talk about the disappearance of Gene Spangler. Now again, a lot of these cases that I'm doing are not fairly known. They are rather obscure. This one might be a little bit more known just because she was an actress. And of course, if you're an actress, especially back when she disappeared, 1949, you were from where? LA. And since I'm going to LA next week, once again, I figured this was appropriate. So, Jean Spangler was 26 years old when she disappeared October 7th, 1949. When I started researching this case, I was struck by a couple of things. Uh, newspaper articles and suspects. Now, why did those two things stick out to me? One, because the newspaper articles were very uh, wrong, especially headlines. You know, one was saying that she was butchered. The other one saying she was um, hunted by a sex fiend. No, they both may be true, but it's not fact. She disappeared and she was never discovered again. So how could either of them possibly <sighs> needed fact checking back then, I guess, as well. And then the suspects. When I started looking at all the suspects, the names, the names that I knew. Uh, Mickey Cohen, an associate of his named Davy Ogle. Uh, mob, they were mobsters for you that don't know um, around that time frame. Kirk Douglas is the name that I knew about. And the reason I know about him is he, obviously, it was a movie star. But one of the movies that I know that he played in was Spartacus. Let's get into Jean Spangler. Very uh, beautiful actress. She had not hit the big time. She had bit parts in movies. Uh, but we have to look deeper than that. Okay, before she became an actress, what was she like? Um, not a lot out there about her that I can find. What I did find was that she did work in a nightclub. And that nightclub was frequented by some mafia type people. And I think that may have been the connection that she had with an individual named Davy Ogle, who mysteriously went missing the day before or the day after Gene did. Hmm. So they know each other and they both went missing at the same time. Sounds like a runaway theory, right? Not so fast, my friend. Victimology would tell us that she got married rather young to an individual named Dexter Benner. That was in 1941, I want to say. Now remember, she went missing in 1949. So there's an eight-year gap. Within that eight-year gap, they had only been married a, a few months, like six months, I think, and they divorced. But they stayed together, as in they would see each other. Well, during this time in 1944, they had a daughter. By 1946, they're going through custody battle. 
So you can see already how this thing is a little bit messy. But this is 1946, the custody battle started. And here's a picture of her during her custody hearing. Um, it's just amazing to me because she wasn't like a big starlet, but yet there's photographs of her at this custody hearing. I find that intriguing. Not necessarily odd, just intriguing. So, 1946 are the custody hearings in which it's a battle between father and uh, mother and that's it, nothing unusual. But what is usual is the heated, tense, and sometimes hate that's spewed between the two parties. Now, I can't say that here because I don't know for sure. The only way you would know that is if it was documented somewhere or you talked to a person who was familiar with both of them. But what's important here is I want to show that it's 1946, okay, when this is happening. She disappeared in 1949. So a full three years removed from these custody hearings. Now, who won the custody hearings? I think... She won uh, initially, or he won initially, and then it went to her. Then she disappeared, and then he got custody. So it seemed like it was a back-and-forth affair. One of the things that he brought up is that she was an unfit mother because of her lifestyle. Apparently, she liked to go out a lot, not unlike a lot of young mothers. She was 26 in L.A. So I don't find that too odd. But what I want to do is I want to jump to the day of her disappearance. Like I said, victimology is very important here, as it is in every case, yet we don't know too much about her, other than she worked at a nightclub, and I think this was before she started becoming an actress and having bit parts in movies. In fact, she had a bit part in a Kirk Douglas movie, and that is going to become relevant here in a little bit when we go over the evidence. So on the day she disappears, young Jean Spang Spangler, around 5 o'clock p.m., tells her daughter, who is being, she was five years old, I believe, at the time, who is being babysat by some friends and relatives, uh, Jean lived with her mom at the time, but her mom was out of town, which is very important when it comes to the evidence as well. So she left her there and said, I will be back. And the daughter asked, you know, where are you going, mommy? She says, I got to go to work. And then she winked. Could you see that wink with my black eye, my swollen eye? I don't know if you could see that. That's what Jean did. She winked, not at her daughter, but at the individual that was babysitting. Now, I think that's important. Because we come to find out, the police checked with the Screen Actors Guild, and there was no movie set working that day. In fact, she wasn't scheduled to work that day. So, in all intent and purposes, I think we can say that she was not working. It's 5 p.m., on October 7th, 1949. She is seen about an hour later at a supermarket browsing by a, a witness. I think it was one, the clerk. Now normally, I don't put a lot of stock into eyewitness testimony saying I've seen somebody here, there. That. I do in this one and I'll tell you why. Because Jean was a starlet. By that, I mean, she wasn't a star yet, but she was very beautiful, very attractive, and I think she would have stuck out being there, and that would have drawn the person's eyes to her. <coughs> Excuse me. And plus, it was not far from where she lived, therefore, she probably frequented that supermarket before. The eyewitness says it appears that she was waiting for somebody. Now, how does he know that? 
Well, I think you can tell that by body language, by looking around a lot, um, milling around, really not doing anything. Uh, I think you can tell that. If you're not shopping, putting stuff into a cart, and you're kind of like looking at magazines, you could infer that you are waiting for somebody. That's the last time she's ever seen, folks. That's it. She didn't come home that night. And so right away, they filed a missing persons report. Again, I don't think they probably took it too seriously, but on October 9th, the next day after she's reported missing, her the very first piece of evidence is found, her purse. And her purse is found in Griff, Griffith Observatory. Now, I'm familiar with this because when I first went out to Los Angeles, uh, five years ago to do my first filming out there. Th I went there. One, because it was it dealt with space, which I'm fascinated by. Just blows my mind that of all of our technology, we can't see the end of it. It's just infinite. My mind can't wrap around that. So I am I am fascinated with it. Number two, Jim Morrison went there for a photo shoot. And I remember seeing pictures of it and... I wanted to be there. So, I'm familiar with it. Had I known that her purse was found there, I would have went to that location as well. But her purse was found there, and what was significant about that, it was it was at the, let me make sure I get this right, at the, it was an entranceway to the, what was it, the, the Fern Garden maybe? Uh, but it was the entrance way there, and the strap was broke. I was able to find this picture, which is crazy, and it's and uh, the you, know, you can see the cop holding it. You know, so let's say there, this picture never existed, and today the investigator said, you know what? I think the offender handled that purse. So we're going to swab it for DNA. What are you going to get, guys? You're going to get mixed DNA, which happens in a lot of these old cases because of this very reason. He doesn't have gloves on. He not his fault. He isn't thinking 50 years, 60 years down the road that we're going to be able to get DNA and link it to a suspect because he touched something. Um... But I just found this photo rather intriguing. Inside that pocket book slash purse is a letter. Okay. And you can see what the letter reads. It's addressed to Kirk. Can't wait any longer. Going to see Dr. Scott. It's best, you know, his mom's out of town. Now, what can you infer from that? I'll tell you what I infer. Number one, it was written recently because mom being out of town. Remember when I said this was going to be important down the road? Well, there you go. It shows that it was probably written current. Two, it's addressed to Kurt. Three, Dr. Scott. So, that's... Huge, huge clues right there, okay? Now, police, obviously, they think like me and you think, hey, we got to follow up on this and we have good clues here. Let's find out who Kirk is. Well, they couldn't find she was associated with anybody but who? Kirk Douglas. Tabloids ran with that. So much so that Kirk Douglas, who was on vacation in Florida, calls police and says, hey, this is Kirk Douglas. I don't know who that girl is. I've been in vacation. He retracted that story a little bit a few days later via his agent and said, wait a second. After he talked to some people, he did know Jean Spangler. She worked as an extra and he kidded around with her on occasion, but never went out with her and doesn't really know her. Okay. That's Kirk's word, his alibi. He's out of state. Dr. Scott, 
who is this? Well, they found a couple of Dr. Scotts and they all denied that, you know, they knew who Gene Spagler was. So, that's the evidence. Those are the clues that we have. Now, are we able to figure out, are we able to deduce what happened to Gene? Well, when you have a missing person, as usual, you have to look at the runaway, you have to look at the foul play. Or, you can throw natural causes in there, you can put suicide in there, but we're not there yet, right? Because we don't even have a body. It's just a missing person. So what we have to figure is, did she go missing on her own accord? Meaning, hey, I've had enough, whatever it is, I'm out. Or the other end of that, did she meet foul play? Well, because of the custody hearings, and because obviously she was granted custody, she had her daughter when she went missing, I think that you could rule out that she went on her own. It, one of the things that struck me as well, and I wrote this down as a red flag of mine, is in the article that I wrote, or that I wrote, that I read, it said police ruled out robbery as a motive. And the reason they ruled that out was because she didn't have any money in the purse. Two, her siblings and the people that were with her that day that she went missing said she didn't have any money with her. I have a problem with that. Number one, you can't rule out robbery because she doesn't have any money in the purse. That makes zero sense. If it was a robbery, there wouldn't be any money in the purse, right? Number two, um, they ruled it out because she also they said that she didn't have any money with her that night. I'd like to know more about that. How do you know that? Where, where's her money at? Does she have a savings account? Does she have a checking account? Where did she keep her money, her paychecks? Those type of things. That comes in handy when you're trying to rule out a runaway scenario, which I think I'm very confident that you can do. Now, you have to look at the connection with uh, a guy that she knew, Davy Ogle, going disappeared, and he's never been found either. But he was an associate of Mickey Cohen a notorious gangster. A lot of people just arbitrarily say, I don't believe in coincidences because it's a cool thing to say. Well, I don't say that because there are coincidences. And I believe that it is completely unrelated. She went missing, he went missing around the same time. He's probably six feet under in the desert somewhere where she... Her fate is probably similar, but for various different reasons. Now, what can now what can we do, or what can we learn about that purse? The strap was broken. Now, that could be that could mean uh, different things, right? Maybe the purse strap broke when she was walking. Highly unlikely though, right? The, the more obvious, the simplest and obvious explanation to it is it was forced from her. Okay? Let's not get cute. You know, there's people out there that will come up with an asinine theory that Okay, a serial killer abducted her. And then when he got done killing her, he buried her. And then he took the purse. And he had the, the smarts about him to rip one of the straps and throw it in the woods to make it look and appear 
that it was a robber. Get the hell out of here. Okay? That's stupid. That's not... That, that, that just doesn't happen. It, it's, it's, it's dumb. The, the, it's dumb. Because number one, you would leave it right in an area for it sure to be found. Right in the middle of the road. You wouldn't try to throw it into the woods. Because it might not be found. So it, it doesn't make sense. Um, but what does make sense to me is that it was a robbery. That somebody tried to pull it from her and run with it. And maybe they got away with it. They don't know that there's no money in there. That's the whole point. So you can't say robbery is not a motive. Even if she had no money. How does the robber know that? He's not a psychic. He doesn't have x-ray vision to look in that pocketbook and say, oh, there's money in there or there's no money in there. He doesn't know that. All he knows, there's a beautiful young lady walking alone. Nobody's around. I'm going to go and snatch it from her. And then he snatches it, keeps running, gets half a mile down the road, looks in it. Damn it. No money. Throws it with its broken strap into the woods. That's very, very possible. Right? Am I the only one that thinks that? Now, let's play this scenario. The unlikely event that she ran into a serial killer. Let's not even say serial killer. Let's make it more believable and just say it was somebody who had nefarious and dastardly deeds on his mind. Why would the strap be broke? Certainly during a struggle, a strap could be broke, right? Doesn't mean he's going for the purse. Maybe she's using the purse as a weapon. Uh, maybe she has it around her neck, going down her arm. However, has it on her arm and he grabs her and she jerks away and the strap breaks. There, there's hundreds of possibilities there. That makes sense as well. Okay? A purse can get ripped, especially a thin strap like that, during a struggle. But does that get us any closer to determining who or what happened to Gene? Well, it rules away, I think, obviously, the runaway scenario. Okay, she's not going to fake her death and throw her purse with everything in it. It just doesn't make sense. But the note. I believe the note gets us more closer to determining what happened than anything else. Now, I'm not saying that this is uh, a scenario. Oh, let me back up. I just glanced at my notes. And I forgot to mention a very, very, very important tidbit that may change your entire perception of this. And it may not. But remember back when she was leaving at 5 o'clock p.m. the day she disappeared for the night and she told her daughter goodbye and winked as if I'm not going to work, but I'm telling my daughter that I'm going to work. She also said that she told the, the grown-up there that she was going to meet her ex-husband to talk about some missed child support payments. That's a huge red flag to me. As it is to you, right? Well, now we have somebody that we obviously can follow up on. Well, police did that, obviously. And guess what? Her ex-husband, Mr. Benner, had an alibi. Supposedly airtight. Well, his alibi was his wife. His new wife. Now... I don't know how airtight wives' alibis can be. They're going to lie, 
right? Yeah, he was here. I was watching a movie with him, whatever. So you, you can't always just believe that. Yet, on the flip side of that, maybe there was more to that alibi that I don't know. Maybe he was actually with his wife at a restaurant and everybody in the restaurant saw him. I don't know. But why would she say that if it wasn't true? The only reason she would say that if it wasn't true is if what she was actually going to do was to put her in a bad light. Does that make sense? Like, uh, let's say, let's say I, I'm putting that scenario and I'm telling my daughter, or not my daughter, let's say I'm telling a, a friend of mine who's in the house and I'm getting ready to leave. And I say, I'm going to meet with my ex-wife. We're going to go have coffee. Okay? No, no B. Well, what if my purpose was I was actually, I was actually going to a strip club? Well, take that back. If it was one of my friends, he'd say, hey, I'll go with you. Let's say my purpose was I am going out to case a bank or rob a bank. Something that he would disapprove of or he would look at me like, what? You know what I mean? That, that happens all the time. So what was she doing that would make her friend maybe shun her? That is key. That is what you have to look at. Now you go back to the note. Read it. What does it make sense to you? I'll tell you what it tells me. It tells me first she was going to meet somebody named Kirk. And it tells me they were going potentially to see a doctor. The first thing that comes to my mind is an abortion. Now, maybe I'm reading into that a little too much. But when you couple that with her potentially, possibly lying to what she is going to do, then it makes sense. In 1949, abortions were illegal. Much like they are now, aren't they? Didn't they just overturn something? Well, let's not get into that. Uh, but it makes me think that maybe this was a premeditated act on this individual, Kirk's, part. Now, Kirk Douglas' name gets thrown in it, and that's a shame. You know, I hate that. I hate when somebody is a suspect. A suspect, they're not even a suspect. Their name gets thrown in, and they have nothing to do with it. Now, I won't do that. But I will say, there are many individuals named Kirk. Could she have been having an affair with somebody? It wouldn't be an affair on her part. She's single, right? But I would surmise that Kirk was probably married and didn't want to have a child. It was rumored by her friends that she was three months pregnant. Now, it makes you wonder. Now, maybe it isn't an abortion. Maybe that has nothing to do with it. Maybe Dr. Scott, Doc Scott, is just a nickname 
of somebody. And police chased this down. And, you know, they didn't, never came up with anything. Could it be a possible scenario where she was supposed to meet this gentleman named Kirk? He had no intention of showing up. And he just said, be here at a certain time. And two goons show up. To take care of her. Purse strap gets ripped in the struggle of throwing her into a car, killing her and getting rid of her. That's a very possible scenario, folks. Now think about it. She's having an affair with this individual named Kurt. She becomes pregnant. He's not happy about it. They go back and forth. Uh, they eventually agree. Okay. he Or he talks her into it. You got to get an abortion. I know a guy. I found a guy. Whatever it is. Um, yes. I guess that makes sense. But if she, if she agreed to it. He sent two people or whatever it was over there to take care of it himself. Why would he commit murder when he could just, if she already agreed to the abortion, right? Once she agreed to it, okay, well. But what if the abortion went bad? Probably weren't very safe back then. I'd like to know the statistics on abortions back in the 40s. Um, well, how many were not successful? So remember at 5 o'clock when she disappeared and then the supermarket guy said he saw her. She made a call home around 7 o'clock and said, I have to work the full eight hours so I will not be home tonight. That's another lie. Now why? That's what you have to focus in on is why is she lying about working? Could it have been that she called because the guy never showed? She waited around for this Kirk. And she thought she'd be home, you know, in four hours. And he didn't show. So now she's waiting around more. And she says, oh, I'll call home, say, hey, I'm not coming home. Or maybe she had the abortion. And she felt sick. Or something. Or the doctor said, you have to wait here. You can't go home. i got to observe you for a while. And she dies. That's very possible as well. I, I, am, I am very confident in saying an illegal doctor performing an illegal abortion, or maybe he was a legal doctor, but perform, performing an illegal act, maybe would not call the police if... I guarantee they wouldn't call the police if he killed her during a surgery. Just get rid of the body. So that is a scenario that you have to look at. But who would be the Kirk? That's the thing. That's, that's the big thing. Now there was allegations that I read that Kirk Douglas uh, sexually assaulted a 16-year-old named Natalie Wood. Remember her? I did a video about her in the boat and Christopher Walken and, man, these Hollywood people. Now, I don't know the, if those allegations are true or not, um, but it was just something that I came across in my research. So Gene Spangler, 26-year-old goes missing. I think we've deduced fairly certain that she didn't run away. She was a victim. Now I don't know if she was just, if you keep it simple and say while she was waiting somebody attempted to rob her. I don't buy that and I'll tell you why. Yes I buy the part where she has the thing or pocketbook on her shoulder and a guy runs by and snatches it and snatches the or breaks the strap and then he runs a half mile realizes there's no money and throws away well how does she die but he's so upset he's gonna go back to her hoping that she hasn't yelled for help 
and then kill her? No, that makes no sense. That, I think, you could rule out robbery. Now, let's say the struggle ensues during a robbery attempt and he, uh, he kills her. He's just going to leave the body there or drag it, you know, 20 feet from where the purse is found. Or it, it's not going to be, she's not going to be out in the middle of nowhere where her body will never be found. And somebody that's on foot that's robbing her is not going to be able to drag her or take her in any secluded setting. So her body would have been found. So initially when I looked, and this is the beauty of deduction and and making the puzzles fit in your mind. When I initially looked at the strap and said, you can't rule out robbery. Well, you can't. But when you start putting all those things together, then you can. You can say, okay, it's not robbery. Because that doesn't make sense. So now you got to look at the note. And you got to look at the purse and put those two together. Those, that strap was not broken just by happenstance. Remember when I said, I do believe in coincidences? Well, this is one coincidence that I would not believe in. Uh, I would not believe that that strap and her going missing and her purse being found there is unrelated. It is definitely related. So, you can infer that although we weren't there and we don't know, and this is a great explanation of inferring. Let's say that we all are at a party inside the house. And when we go in that house, outside it is sun shining. It's beautiful. And in this house, we're down in the basement. There's no windows, no nothing. Music's on. We're having a good time. Five hours later, we walk outside and everything is wet. It's not raining out. We didn't see it rain. But we can infer that it did rain, right? So in this case, because of the broken strap, because of the letter that's written to Kirk about going to see a doctor, specifically when the mom's away, you can infer that she was meeting a gentleman named Kirk and they were going to see a doctor the night that she disappeared. Couple that with her lying about why she was going to meet somebody. And I think you can figure it out. I believe that it is also possible um, that the husband, she was going to meet him. And maybe I would think that they were still seeing each other even though he was remarried. And maybe she became pregnant to him. That's a scenario that I would not throw out. Now, the letter doesn't make sense then because it's addressed to a Kirk. I would look into all the ex-husband's friends that are named Kirk. Maybe she was going to meet the ex-husband. But she wasn't meeting him to talk about child support payments. She was meeting him to talk about an abortion. They've already went through, we don't need another child. We're going through custody with this one. But they were still seeing each other. And that happened in the past as well. They were divorced in 1941 when they met each other. But yet they had a child in 1944. So, I mean, they were still being sexually active together. So maybe she wasn't lying about the part where she was going to meet her ex-husband. However... Maybe she was lying about why. Now that makes sense to me too, but the Kirk part throws it off. Why is she addressing this to Kirk? I would want to know if any of the ex-husband has any friends named Kirk who maybe, uh, you know, he sent over to pick her up or whatever it was. Little less believable than the original scenario, which is she's meeting a gentleman named Kurt. But it's a scenario nonetheless. And, it, and it's not too far out there. All right, let me go over my notes here and make sure that I got everything. 
October 7, 49, she disappeared. Two days later, her purse was found in Griffin Park. At 5 o'clock, when she disappeared, she said she was meeting her ex, and then she was going to work that night. Winked. At 7 o'clock, she called and said she would be home after she spent the night because uh, she had to work a full eight hours, which is another lie. The suspects uh, went over the husband, the torn purse, the note. Oh, so another scenario. The Black Dahlia. I should have wrote this down, and I didn't. I'm going off memory now. I'm going to say 1947 is when Black Dahlia happened. Uh, Elizabeth Short murdered. There's some people that want to connect these two, and I'm going to dispel that, I think, fairly easily. Yes, both Los Angeles, both within the same area, both within a time frame. What? Two years. So whoever murdered the Black Dahlia could possibly murder Gene Spangler. But I'll tell you why I don't believe that. Think about the Black Dahlia and how she was found. She was displayed. Somebody wanted her found. Right? She was bisected. She was cut up, but the body was placed right where somebody knew that they would be found and shocked. Gene Smangler just disappeared. I believe if this was the Black Dahlia, especially if it's the second murder, he would pose it the same way. He did that for a specific reason. Whether it was to humiliate Elizabeth Short, or whether it was to enhance his own gratification, more than likely sexual, sexual gratification, I think he would do the same thing with this. Or he would take credit for it, much like the Zodiac did. Uh, but meh, he might not take credit for them. Let me take that back. But I think he would pose it Similar. The more I think of them, let me think about that. I, I think that would be the case. But I would have to look into the Black Dahlia murder a little bit more. I have a couple books here. Black Dahlia Avenger and Black Dahlia or something. Two books that uh, a gentleman sent to me. He authored them. And... I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but I did read them, and there's some good evidence, I guess, but I don't want to get into into the Black Dahlia or the guy, gentleman that wrote them books. But he did send them to me. Uh, I will do one on Elizabeth Short at some point in time. Is it possible? But these are related. I'm going to say yes. It's possible. Um... But, because she is completely disappeared, and the other one was posed, I'm going to say it's not probable. And I'll leave it at that. My mind could change on that once I delve into Elizabeth Short a little bit more. But right now, I'm going to say not related. I wrote down here, rule out robbery, question mark, because of no money. We went into that pretty good. The abortion, the red flag about meeting the husband, why did she lie about that? Three months pregnant, and Davy will go missing at the same time. Uh, fascinating case. Like I said, I'm going to be out to L.A. next week, so maybe I'll make another trip to Griffith Park just to see where that purse was thrown. This is a fascinating case with, like, all missing persons cases. They just fascinate me. How can people just disappear without a trace? Well, it happens all the time. All the time. But I think we've dispelled that she ran away. And I think uh, we can rule out robbery. Not because she didn't have any money. That's stupid. But the scenario that we went through, I think we could rule out robbery. I think she was meeting somebody. And I... <laughs> I hate to say my gut tells me it was an abortion, but why else would she be going to see a doctor? 
it, it, it had to be something that she did not feel good about. Meaning she felt ashamed that she was doing this. So it could be that she had a sexually transmitted disease. I guess that's possible. But for me, her being a struggling actress, working in a nightclub, having a child, child support payments, having custody battles, not wanting to have another kid and be rumored to have being three months pregnant and having a note saying you're going to see a doctor. The totality of all that would lead me to believe in abortion. And whether she died during the procedure or before she even got to that procedure, that's the question. Fascinating case, and hopefully this will spur some more stuff. What was crazy to me is that the police said there isn't even no reports anymore. I think they talked to uh, a couple of LAPD detectives, and they said they don't even have the case. She's just a missing person. The purse is gone. Everything is gone. It blows my mind. Anyway, hopefully this will spur something in somebody that knows something, and they'll contact LAPD, and they'll do the right thing. So my heart's out to Miss Spangler's kids, relatives. Um, I hope that one day this case will be unsolved no more. With that, Maine's out. We're